Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I'm here to help you finish your Christmas shopping list and let everyone else over there stiff arm their competition while trying to fight off that trip to fan on Turkey Night. Now, what we did was we partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get up to 75% off over 30,000 autographed sports collectibles during this holiday season. They have something for everyone. But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes so there are no extra markups, and they choose to then pass that savings on to you, the customer. Now, all orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. But hurry up because customers are so stark raving mad for RSA that memorabilia sells out daily. All you have to do is head over to shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Again, that's shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. So don't wait to bring home your favorites and own a piece of sports history for you and the loved ones on your shopping list this holiday season. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today we bring you the story of Elgin Baylor. He was the original hang time in the NBA. He was a player that took basketball from a horizontal game to a vertical game. He was the first player that played above the rim. When you think of high flyers like Zach Levine, Vince Carter, Michael Jordan, Dr. J, or anyone else who seemed to defy gravity, then you have to start with Elgin Baylor. He was the first one who regularly used his leaping ability as a weapon. Now I want to bring you his story because he has somewhat of a complicated legacy. Now it will take me two episodes to share this with you. Part two of our story will be shared next week. Now, if you have ever spent time looking at the great NBA players from the past, then you will have heard of the name Elgin Baylor. He is part of the NBA 75 list from last season, and many basketball historians place Baylor in their top 20 players of all time. The basketball writer Bill Simmons wrote a book in 2009 called The Book of Basketball, and in that book he placed Elgin Baylor as his number 14 player of all time. Now, when I first started watching NBA basketball in the mid-1980s, I only knew of Elgin Baylor as the general manager of the LA Clippers, and the Clippers were absolutely awful back then. Only later did I find out that he used to play for the Lakers and was teammates with Jerry West for 12 years. West was the general manager of the LA Lakers and was collecting championships the way that other people collect sneakers. Meanwhile, Elgin Baylor looked like he bought all of his sweaters from Bill Cosby's yard sale and doing everything he could to put the Clippers out of business. In the city of LA, Elgin Baylor was a joke as a general manager. He ran the Clippers for 22 years and only had two winning seasons. Any other team would have fired him after just the first two or three years, but not the Clippers. The ownership of the Clippers did not seem to care that the team lost games year after year. It almost seemed like they were not even trying to win. Only when I started to get serious about basketball history did I discover just how good he was as a player. And let me just list a few of his accolades. Baylor was an 11-time All-Star player. He was named to the All-NBA team 10 times. He was the 1959 Rookie of the Year and the 1959 All-Star Game MVP. And he made every top player list that the NBA has ever produced that he was eligible for. He also went to the NBA Finals 8 times and lost all 8 times. Now this is what I mean when I say that his legacy is complicated. In his time, he was considered by his peers to be the best one-on-one player in the league. He was unstoppable. For defenders around the NBA, Elgin Baylor was their nightmare matchup, but he could not win the NBA Finals. Here's another bit of information. Even though he has been retired for over 50 years, he still has the third highest career scoring average in league history. That's right, he's third. Michael Jordan is number one with an all-time highest scoring average at 30.12 points per game for his entire career. Will Chamberlain is next at 30.07 points per game. And in third place, after 75 plus years of NBA basketball, 
is Elgin Baylor with 27.36 points per game. Now, by the way, Kevin Durant is fourth with 27.18 points per game, and LeBron James is fifth with 27.13 points per game. So how often do you hear the name Elgin Baylor mentioned in a conversation about the greatest scorers in league history? Unless you are talking to someone who was part of the NBA back in the 1960s, the answer is hardly ever, and that is a shame. Of course, that is why we do this podcast, to keep these older players in the conversation. By scoring average, Baylor is literally the third best scorer in NBA history, and I think that deserves to be part of the conversation. But let us go back to the beginning. Elgin Baylor was born on September 16th, 1934 in Washington, D.C. He was born to John and Uziel Baylor. Segregation was still the rule of the day. There were still separate schools, restaurants, movie theaters, bathrooms, and drinking fountains for black people and white people. Baylor grew up near a recreation center with a basketball court, but he was not allowed to use it because he was black. Thankfully, there was a boys club a little bit further away where he was welcome to play. His two older brothers, Sal and Kermit, played there and he just followed them. As a kid, he was bigger, stronger, and faster than most of the other kids. Like most players that play in the NBA, Elgin Baylor won the genetics lottery and possessed size and coordination that very, very few people are ever blessed with. For his first two years of high school, he played at Phelps Vocational High School for the 1951 and 1952 seasons. It was an all-black high school and they were only allowed to play other all-black high schools. He dominated the competition, averaging nearly 28 points per game and 19 rebounds per game. And he was named two-time All-City Player. But he was not a good student and dropped out of high school after just the second year. He spent the following year just working. He played basketball in local leagues, but it was not the same as playing for a high school. After that year, he officially transferred to Spring Arn High School, and he made All-City again, and absolutely dominated the competition in both scoring and rebounding. Just like he did before, he set a Washington DC city record with 63 points in a single game against his old high school. He was unstoppable even back then. As high school ended, you would think that he would have had Division I college coaches just crawling all over that gym begging Baylor to come to their school and fulfill his destiny. Well, not so. It was 1954 and most Division I coaches had no need for a black player as good as Elgin Baylor. Now, what I just said sounds very counterintuitive. Today, every college coach in the country wants as much talent as he can get. It does not matter where the player comes from or what he looks like, but back in the early 1950s, most coaches had to be careful recruiting a player like Elgin Baylor. Now, most coaches from northern schools had no problem having one or two black players on their team, but those players had to be role players. They could not have a black player be the star of the team, and Elgin Baylor was definitely a star. He ended up at one of the only schools that would let him be the star, the University of Idaho. He was a 20-year-old freshman when most freshmen are 18. He played there for only one year and averaged 30 points per game. It was a great start to his career, but he was convinced to transfer to a bigger school, but at meant sitting out a year. There was no transfer portal back then, so he left for Seattle University. He sat out his first year at Seattle University because of the way the transfer rules worked back then. It was the 1955-56 school year, and he could practice with the team, but he could not play in any of the games. But the interesting thing was that it was 1956 and he was 22 years old, and that meant that he was eligible for the NBA draft. Everyone in the NBA knew that Baylor intended on playing for two more years at Seattle University, so teams were hesitant to waste a draft pick on someone who might never play for them, no matter how good he might be. But the NBA draft had no limit on how many rounds they went. Today, the NBA only has two rounds for the draft. Back in 1956, the NBA just kept going and going and going until nobody wanted to pick anymore. So the Minneapolis Lakers took a chance and selected Baylor in the 14th round, the 91st pick overall, and the pick was wasted. Baylor stayed at Seattle and played two more seasons, and for those two seasons, he played incredibly well. He averaged 30 points per game and 20 rebounds per game. That kind of talent would be the first overall pick in the draft in almost any era. In the spring of 1957, he led Seattle all the way to the NCAA championship game where they lost 84-72 to the University of Kentucky, coached by Hall of Famer Adolph Rupp. But Baylor still won the tournament's Most Outstanding Player Award. He was the obvious pick as he was such a force of nature. While Seattle University was still recovering from losing the national championship game in 1957, the Minneapolis Lakers were being sold. 
Initially purchased for just $15,000 in the mid-1940s, the Lakers are being sold to new owners Bob Short and Frank Ryan for $150,000. These two events were going to come together just a year later. At the end of the 1958 basketball season, Elgin Baylor had proved himself to be the best college basketball player in the country. At the same time, the Minneapolis Lakers had one of the worst seasons in their team's history. George Mikan had retired two years earlier. The team was falling apart, leaving the Lakers just a shell of what they were during the first half of the 1950s. With a record of just 19-53, and 53, they had the worst record in the NBA, which meant they automatically received the first overall pick in the 1958 NBA Draft. Now this is a good place to take a break and I'll be right back with a story of what the Minneapolis Lakers did with that number one pick. You can probably guess already. We'll be right back. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hi, everybody. Dan and Andrew from Hello Old Sports here. We wanted to drop in and let you know about our latest episode. That's right. We interviewed the co-authors of Phyllis George, Shattering the Ceiling, a biography of groundbreaking broadcaster Phyllis George. And her life is really sort of a journey through 20th century America, from Miss America pageants to the Kentucky State House to the groundbreaking NFL Today show on CBS, even the Kentucky Colonels, the old ABA. We got into all sorts of stories about the Celtics under Red Auerbach, about the interview with Roger Staubach, about really all sorts of things, a fight between Brent Musburger and Jimmy the Greek. We really enjoyed talking with Lenny Shulman and Paul Volpone, who teamed up to write this book. The book is on sale right now wherever books are sold. You know, within reason, garage sales, probably not. So go (laughs) ahead and pick up a copy today. And if you want a chance to win the book, you can go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash giveaways and register for a chance to win. Goodbye, old sports. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of Elgin Baylor. The year was 1958 and Baylor had just completed one of the best college careers of all time. He was clearly the best college player in the country and the Minneapolis Lakers held the first pick in the NBA draft that year. The Lakers were also having financial difficulties. Without Mikan, the team was not selling as many tickets as they used to during the championship glory days. And that is natural. Very few NBA teams from any era can sell as many tickets when they are the worst team in the league as when they are the best team in the league. And the thing about the 1950s is that the NBA was not as established as it is today. It was not yet the multi-billion dollar league that we see. Going out of business was a very real possibility for a team that had won five championships at the time. The team needed to do something drastic in order to sell tickets and keep the franchise alive. Possession of the number one pick in the draft would go a long way in keeping the Lakers alive. They just had to make sure they picked the right player. Bob Short and Frank Ryan, the new owners of the Lakers, knew exactly what they wanted to do with that first pick. So, with the first pick of the 1958 NBA Draft, the Minneapolis Lakers selected Elgin Baylor from Seattle University. Baylor's college coach John Castellani had said, quote, Elgin has more moves than a clock, unquote. Baylor was joining a Lakers team in desperate need for help. They already had Hot Rod Hundley and Slick Leonard, but with Baylor, they would begin to rebuild the team. In his very first year in the NBA as a 24-year-old rookie, he averaged 25 points per game and 15 rebounds per game. He was easily selected for the All-Star Game and won MVP of the All-Star Game. He also ran away with the Rookie of the Year award. He even had one game against the Cincinnati Royals where he dropped 55 points. He had one of the great rookie seasons of all time. And I'm not even done yet. 
The year before Baylor arrived, the Lakers had the worst record in the NBA. And then in his rookie season, he led them all the way to the NBA Finals where they faced Bill Russell, Bob Cousy, Bill Sharman, and the rest of the Boston Celtics. The Celtics swept the Lakers four games to none, but still, with just the addition of Elgin Baylor, the Lakers went from worst to the NBA Finals. That is how good Elgin Baylor was. That is how much of an impact he made on a team. Bill Russell once called Baylor, quote, the godfather of hang time, unquote. But there was one really negative incident that happened to Baylor during that rookie season. It was January 16, 1959. The Minneapolis Lakers traveled to Charleston, West Virginia to play against the Cincinnati Royals. The NBA used to do this kind of thing where they would ask two teams to play each other in a non-NBA city in order to try to gauge the interest of the fans for any potential future expansion. In other words, did West Virginia care enough about NBA basketball to potentially support a team of its own? In fact, that season, out of the possible 72 games, the Lakers played 24 of their games in neutral locations. It almost seemed like they were playing everywhere except Minneapolis. Anyway, the hotel that the Lakers were staying in did not allow Baylor to check in specifically because he was black. He was easily the Lakers' best player, but he could not abide by the way he was treated. He skipped the game in protest. If anything positive came out of that situation, is that the Lakers never again picked that kind of a hotel. From then on, they only booked hotels that would allow all of their players to stay. Now, as far as the way that Baylor played, he was the first NBA player who could easily leap and just hang up there forever. At 6'5", he was quick and strong. Coaches at almost every level tell their players never to leave their feet without knowing what they are going to do with the ball. But with Baylor, he could leave his feet, look around, figure out his options, have a bite to eat, and then make his move for either a shot or a pass. As I said at the top, Elgin Baylor was the player who first took the NBA from a horizontal game to a vertical game. He played above the rim and set the blueprint for all of the players that would come after him. He was hang time before Dr. J and Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and Vince Carter and Zach Levine or Aaron Gordon. Elgin Baylor was the original hang time. It's really hard to defend a guy when he is flying through the air three feet above your head. But that was Elgin Baylor. Well, that takes us through his rookie year in the NBA. Be sure to come back next week when we share the rest of the story of Elgin Baylor. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There, you will find shorter historical posts, as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care, and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sports historynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.